Good evening and welcome to Speakers Corner UK channel. I want to welcome my co-reviewer for this particular video. Drastic, good evening, sir. How are you? I'm very well. Yeah, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Obviously, I've stepped away from doing these sort of videos that often, but um, you sort of gently twisted my arm. And it's good to, <laughs> good to be back here again. So we're going to be reviewing a video called Time to Acknowledge Science Debt to Islam. And it's got um, one of the regular apologists down at Speaker's Corner called Mansur. So let me bring that up now. And uh, we will share our screen here so that we can play that. There we go. Hopefully that is there. Let's get started. So how has science made us go away from a concept of a originator or a creator without understanding more about the reality? Because science has made us more and more aware of the intricacy of our environment, of our world, natural world, how things operate, we know better. Previously, some people may have attributed things to tooth fairies or you know, aliens or you know, whatever, right? Um, but now we know why thunderstorm happens. It's not because of a thunder god called Thor, right? We know why things, where there's a rainbow. It's not because you know, there's a god of rainbow and put it there and it, yeah. 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 just a quick one here actually i think that was going a little bit too quickly and oh, no, yeah it was and so we'll just slow down a tad um obviously we we know these things now it's not and just by the way as well in case you didn't know um mansur is a muslim now none of these things are uh, made clear in the quran itself so just to be clear these are men you know whoever it is with all around the world you know trying to understand what's going on in the world uh, it could have of course been uh, put into the books themselves with stunning accuracy that would have in fact given us reasons to think that um, these books are incredible but unfortunately for anybody who has read the Quran uh, it's woefully lacking in any sort of depth or substance in terms of the natural world I don't know if you've got anything to add there at all uh, drastic no I mean I would, I would totally agree with that assessment and as we're about to get on to um the the Quran it, it it doesn't really encourage the kind of scientific um, uh, looking at the world in which Mansour is about to claim that it does, and I think we're going to go into a little bit of detail on that now. There's a, there is a mechanical reasons in our natural universe when we observe and understand the natural laws, we appreciate the working, the mechanics of this world. But I want to know from you, what's your name for it? Sophia yeah. Ayman Sophia, Sophia, nice to meet you. I want to know how knowing the mechanics of our universe, of our world, somehow makes us to disbelieve in the creator of our universe. Well, as I said before, I'm agnostic. So, what do you mean by that? Everyone... That, means, that means that I don't believe in religion, I don't believe that there's a God, but I don't believe in a general sense I agree, yeah. but in specific specific sense I disagree. Islam in particular for that specific sense, always considered science and religion like with twin sisters. They don't contradict. Because if you were to read the Quran... Yeah. Okay, again, <laughs> um, I'm sure you want to say something as well. You you go first, please. Well, yeah, uh, it, it's it's a complete myth that um, science and the Quran are somehow harmonious or that the Quran encourages scientific thinking. Um, they, they are directly in opposition to each other on many points. And I think it's it's been clear that the Muslims uh, will accept science where it agrees with the Quran or doesn't contradict it. In any other case, they will take the Quran over science, which is the complete opposite of how the scientific method is supposed to work. Yeah, and of course, there's a number of things in the Quran when straightforwardly read that don't match our understandings at all sort of like the earth, you know, being sort of rolled out like a carpet and many other things as well. Uh, and so, of course, what happens, though, is they just reinterpret these things. And so that's the sort of game that the, the Muslim apologists play. But again, of course, God in his infinite wisdom could have made it incredibly unique. And it doesn't mean that it has to tell us about everything in the world around us, but certainly tell us he knew on certain amazing things that nobody could have known. But when when these sort of claims are made, uh, of course, they're, they're just terrible. They're just sort of vague things that people can read in whatever they want. And, of course, that's what um, they rely on. But people like us, myself and Drastic and many others, hopefully many of you who are listening, have a much higher standard. And so you're not going to be 
fooled by any of these things. But certainly science and um, Islam are not in lockstep. Uh, if we're going to take a, a more critical life, you're going to have some, some sort of general view. You might be able to somehow uh, make the two of them work together. But, you know, anything more than that, and you're going to see this division between the two. And I think I'd just put, point out one of the obvious ones would be something like evolution, which is flat out rejected by the majority of Muslims um, because of the Adam and Eve story within the Quran. So that's one kind of really blatant example. That's right. Quran is always emphasizing, go and travel around the earth, inside the earth, go and see how God originated the creation. Do you not see the, the alteration between the day and the night and the alteration between the sun and the moon, how they are rotating in his own orbit constantly? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On, yeah. I mean, the, this again it's the exact opposite of what you would expect if somebody was trying to look scientifically at the world and trying to gain knowledge the quran is telling you yes look at the world this is somehow evidence that it all came from the creator so it's not telling you to go seek answers it's telling you this is evidence of the answer that islam is already giving you so it's the complete opposite of seeking knowledge and we hear this all the time with uh, muslim apologists it's telling you to do the exact opposite. Don't look for knowledge. All the knowledge is already in the Quran. Yeah, and you notice there that he sort of gave the, the traditional examples, the sun and the moon in their own orbit. Of course, you could say the, the moon is, but the sun isn't. And, and the, the length of apologetics these people go to, to try and claim that it is by somehow claiming that it's orbiting the entire uh, galaxy once every 200 and 50 260,000 years oh yeah no it is in its in its orbit what's more <laughs> likely that it's orbiting the entire galaxy and that's what's being referred to in the quran or that it was ignorant people in a desert in the seventh century looking up and thinking that the sun and the moon were orbiting around the earth like most other humans did at the time far more likely that's in fact what the quran was talking about not what they want to sort of cherry pick today and try and find something whatever latest this, I think, is what happens drastic. Whatever latest uh, scientific discovery happens, there's theists, in this case Muslims, looking through the book and go, let's see where we can make this match up. Let's post our yep. reason, look back at the book, see where we can fit this in, and then go and claim that's what the book was always talking about. Absolutely. And it's it's so much easier to see it in its historical context that this is echoing many other texts of antiquity where they're operating from the assumption of a geocentric model of the solar system where the earth is the center and all the planetary bodies and the sun and the moon are all orbiting the earth. So that's the most obvious and easiest plain reading of the text. Yeah. Simply driving us to reflect and observe and ponder and make inferences from natural world into the controller, the affairs, the orderer, the creator, the originator of this universe. So science has always been, in fact, an encouragement from the Islamic teachings rather than suppression of that evidence. Always been. In fact, the scientific revolution, the Renaissance, happened precisely because Europe came in contact with the Muslim world in which they're flourishing. They're flourishing in science and technology. Where in yeah, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not convinced that claim is true. It's like Europe didn't decide to do this on their own. It required Muslims or they came in contact with the Muslims. Now, there is some sort of golden age. It's not as, as big as what these people want to hype up. Uh, but the claim that it, it's only because they came in contact, I think that he'd have to demonstrate. But, of course, this lady is obviously not necessarily going to ask that question. You and I were standing there. Every time I hear a claim, right, this is if you ever went to stand there and they make a claim like, where did you get that from? Show me where that's the case. Because what happens is these guys make a lot of claims and they're very used to nobody challenging them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea that um, the Islamic Golden Age was somehow responsible for the scientific revolutions in Europe um, in later centuries is, I would say, largely a myth. I mean, they certainly did um, rediscover lost scientific knowledge from ancient greece and uh, some of the uh, kept some of the roman knowledge alive but um for, for the most part it, it wasn't this neat transfer like like the muslims just handed off a baton in a relay race it wasn't that at all um much of it was just independent discoveries in europe and an advancement of the scientific method and yes there's there's some uh, some influence from the islamic world but nowhere near as much um as they would give the emphasis to. They, they, they essentially want to take credit for not just the Industrial Revolution, but 
scientific revolution all the way up to the digital revolution that we've had in the 20 and 21st century. And that's an untenable claim in my view. Yeah, that's right. Just claim, claim credit for everything. And then, um, don't, don't actually provide the evidence. Yeah. That's, that's typical sort of modus operandi. In England, people, even the Queen of England didn't have a bath for a month and they were like living in sewages. Sewage. Right, stop, stop there. Stop there. Sorry. The, the, this is, really irritating because this is repeating a myth about the medieval world uh medieval europe in particular that there was uh, everybody was just covered in muck everyone was filthy it was like a scene out of the um the monty Python movie uh, quest for the holy grail it's not the case there were there were many many bathhouses across medieval europe soap as a trade commodity went back to something like the ninth century in europe so He's picking on a, peculiar, a peculiarity with Queen Elizabeth. Um, she was known to not bathe very often, but this was more of a superstition that certain royal family members had about catching disease through excessive bathing. This was not the case in um, for most normal people. They did used to bathe. They did used to have a certain minimum standard of cleanliness. This is a myth that has been perpetrated about the European kind of um, Middle Ages, which... It's just not backed by the evidence. And I think he's another funny thing that he's pointing to. Queen Elizabeth reigned something like 200 years after the so-called Islamic Golden Age ended. So for many centuries before that, bathing was commonplace. You had bathhouses all over European cities and towns. So it's just not true what he's saying. Yeah. Spain or Morocco, all these places, they had a sewage system underground, overground lighting system, that kind of advancement in science and technology. Sorry, got to stop there again, Rob, just, on, just on that point. I think if Stops was here, he'd have a field day on this one. Um, this idea, yeah, th there were limited sewage systems in some of the larger Muslim towns and cities, and particularly in Spain, but it was not commonplace. And Bearing in mind this kind of um, sewage uh, system technology, it was really kind of perfected by the Romans with their aqueduct system. And yes, it did fall into a lot of disuse by the Europeans. But um, there wasn't that much time between when Muslims were commonly using it in, in certain places in Spain, which was around sort of the 11th, 12th, 13th century. By the 14th, 15th century, it was starting to become regularly common to have sewage systems in larger european towns and cities in other places so again this idea that everybody was just completely backwards with their technology there was no proper sanitation through the rest of europe another myth and as for the um the lighting in the street i can't remember the specifics i know that stop spamming has gone on about this in the past um i think it was essentially things like torches in in certain main plazas in larger cities so just like flaming torches, the way he talks about it is if they've got some kind of like 19th century um, gas amp or early electric light system. This is what he's trying to portray when he says that. And again, it's just a complete myth. Yeah. Uh, discouraged anyone of critical thinking and understanding the reality is always been Muslim scientists or the ones who, when they received the guidance of the Quran, they explored from that teaching why God is telling us to go and wonder about the universe. Let's go. What did the Greeks know? What did the Hindus know? The... Well, again, that's a dubious, um, that is a dubious uh, interpretation that the Quran is telling us to go out there and, and look at everything. If you read that, that uh, those verses that he's talking about, um, it can just as easily be interpreted. And I would argue um, certainly as lightly, if not more lightly, that all it's the verse are saying is ponder the Quran, not ponder the universe out there and go look at and start doing science. It talks about pondering, uh, but in that context, it can just as easily be about the Quran. So, but of course what they do here in the, just again in Speaker's Corner, they will give you their interpretation and make as if it's the interpretation. Now, you and I and others that know better and have been talking about these for some time, no, all we have to do is, but that's your interpretation. Let's open up the book. The biggest thing I do whenever I'm speaking to Muslims and I'm doing it seriously, I'm not just mucking about, I'll open up or I'll get a digital copy and I'll ask them to quote the verse. And then I'll read the verse out loud. Uh, and I'll have multiple translations because, again, what they'll do is they'll take a summary of some verse and make as if it's the real one. 
but then even if they then they'll they'll also cherry pick a particular English translation. So it's always good to have at least three. I use Pixel, Sahi International, Yusuf Ali. Those are my three go to. So you've got some, a couple of older ones and one of the more modern ones, and you can look at all three of them uh, just to see do they do the verses largely say the same thing, or are they picking one particular verse to make it back up what they want to claim? So you just got to be a bit careful with these sort of things. And well, by the way, not... go on. Oh. No, what well, I was going to say, there is not a single verse that I've come across in the Quran which, when it's talking about um, pondering the world or seeking knowledge or um, using your reason, every single one which I've come across has the context, as, as you're talking about, Rob, when you look at the surrounding verses, it's essentially saying, be wary of people who will challenge um, the knowledge of the believers, or it will be things like, um, there's one verse where, where Allah's is supposed to be saying, um, you know, he doesn't like those who are deaf, dumb and do not reason but then you look at the earlier verses and it's essentially talking about um those uh, he considers those people those who are challenging the belief in the quran or in allah so it's always got this context of um knowledge for the sake of um believing in allah believing in islam that's that's it in i cannot think of a single verse which directly says yes go out learn use your reasoning um expand your mind learn about the world without having that context which to, in my mind completely destroys the idea that it's there just for purely learning or purely finding out knowledge about the world mm. the romans the persians the byzantians the chinese they tried to accumulate as much as possible the greek philosophy science and technology was even dead at that time they resurrected it they revived it they translated the work back in arabic and then when everything's translated you know what they did they started producing their own contribution to science and technology and literature and culture, ethics and morality. You have you all the avenues. They started naming the stars. That's why you find, well, difficult to find. I, I take back sometimes because they have Latinized the names of the scientists. Avicenna, Averos. Does it sound like Muslim to you? It doesn't. Because Ibn Sina, if I say... Just to be clear, I haven't, I haven't looked this up. Is he claiming that Muslims um, had discovered or named the stars or something like that? Is that the claim that he's making here? Yeah, I, particularly naming the stars. And I think there is a certain amount of truth to that, as there is a certain amount of truth that um, the previous scientific knowledge was translated into Arabic, you know, the old kind of uh, ancient Greek knowledge. Um, but as far as I know, most of it was in relation to their religious duties, which is why there's this heavy focus on the stars and it, it to kind of um, go alongside Islamic um cosmology and that kind of thing um in terms of actual new inventions and uh, new discoveries there's it's very thin on the ground when you look at um the islamic golden age yes there's a few minor improvements here and there and not to say that it wasn't some very intelligent muslims who did do science but it's nowhere near the level which he's trying to portray if I said Ibn Sina, you'd say, oh, Ibn Sina is an Arabic name. Averos, even Rushd. But they've Latinized it. And because of this Latinization of the knowledge that took place, that's why the West, the in general living today people, they don't appreciate the Islamic contribution to science and technology. Did you know in medicine? Well, also, sorry, there's, there's, Sina, there's, there's a point that's worth mentioning here as well, which I think a lot of people will know if they have, have looked into the so-called Islamic Golden Age. Many of the well-known scientists of the time would have been considered heretical and certainly by today's standards if you look at kind of the typical salafis the traditionalists which a lot of the dar apologists ascribe to that version of islam they would actually call these people heretics because they had very unorthodox islamic views some of them weren't even really muslims so it's kind of trying to have your cake and eat it they will reject science on the one hand but then they will claim all these many of these who were kind of heretical kind of thinkers they will say, oh, well, yeah, you know, this is this is some fantastic contribution from Islam. And it's a well, whatever good contribution they made tended to be in spite of the religion. That's that's certainly how I would say anyway. Yeah. Seen us, medical textbook called Al Qanun Fi Al Tib. It's called, known as the Canon. 
went through 17 editions, at least in Europe, as a textbook, over a few hundred years in Europe as a medical textbook. This is the level of contribution they made that it went. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry Rob, I know I'm interrupting a lot here, but I, I do remember this from another video which I did um, on Smile to Jana when he was talking about science, and he mentioned this um, book, this canon book. Again, it is true that it appears um, as part of um, European kind of medical uh, texts for some centuries. But the point is, almost all the information in that book, when I looked into it, was wrong. So it's not that impressive to me to say, yes, OK, they inherited much of this, um, uh, uh, much of this gathered medical knowledge. But it's not like it had the theory of germ disease in there. It's not like it had, you know, much of it was kind of spiritual kind of um um uh, cures for diseases and things like this so there was a lot of wrong information so i don't think it's that impressive to say yes they used all this islamic knowledge and it was wrong until basically up until the 19th century yeah that's a very good point right if you're going to claim it um then as you point out there's going to be a lot of mistakes in there which again that's fine if they were doing it by by you know men but part of this, the part of the hidden premise here is that Islam inspired this. And if Islam inspired this and Islam is sort of God's message, then you would expect um, few, if any, errors, or at least this inspiration would certainly uh, be more concise, more devoid of errors, if that is the case. So as you point out, they can't have their cake and eat it. So uh, that's, a, that's a good point you make years as a textbook. A textbook written today is outdated next two years. Back then, the contribution they made in terms of whether it's a surgical instrument, whether it's optics or optometry, chemistry, you name it, it was there to last for a long time. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, but he really doesn't seem to get that um, the, the reason that it wasn't updated was because knowledge was static. The very fact that modern medical textbooks get updated so often is because we're constantly learning new things. So that's actually a point against them, the fact that the, the the state of learning was so poor that this book of mostly wrong information hung around for like 500 years. That's a point against him. And yet he's acting as if this is proof that the knowledge was so good. No, it was proof that the state of learning was very poor. Yeah, it's exactly the same point I was going to make. Oh, sorry. <laughs> to be antithetical and totally contradicting these two fields of knowledge. When you talk about epistemology, Quran addresses us to be inquisitive, to, to know, to, to understand and to reflect. And even it says, do they have hearts that is closed? They don't want to ponder and reflect. You know what's wrong with them? So when we talk about agnosticism, if you want to suspend your judgment into, I am not sure about whether a creator exists or not, because of lack of evidence or the non clarity of evidence, we can try to help to have a discussion on that. But if you are saying that I don't even see a possibility with the tools that we are using to know whether the creator exists or not, then the discussion has no meaning because there's no possibility. Well, she's not saying that. Uh, firstly, I don't think she, she sort of got agnosticism particularly well defined in the beginning, but she's certainly not saying it's not possible. So uh, I don't know why he's mentioning that. Yeah. Creator in the situation. Yeah. So it's very important for us to understand what are we using? Our tools to ascertain the reality of something. For example, if I want to know how I look like, am I going to look at this stone floor? It's not reflective. I cannot see my face in it. It's not the right tool to use. I need to use something that is shiny and reflective, like a mirror. If I want to see 3D of me, my back and so on, I need more than one mirror because it's one mirror. Let me just stop it here, just on principle here. I'm not going to with a particular example but rather the asking for an example now i get this I, I spend a fair amount of time on clubhouse now days and so i'm interacting with people one on one a lot more and and a lot of muslims do this but other theists as well um they want to give examples you typically you're going to give an example if somebody's not sure or if you want to drive the point home but you but you are not certain that you you presented it clearly the concept whatever it is you're trying to explain you can, you can potentially gauge from the person or by their response, you think, okay, let me give you an example to make it clear. But what they do here and what he's done here specifically is given some concept and then got straight to an example, right? This makes it, now it sounds like he's preaching and now it sounds like he's got all this authority. And I, I haven't remember watching the whole thing through, uh, but the lady here will now pros probably just be asking questions instead of challenging. So it's like a subtle trick here to make, to give themselves more authority you didn't need to give an example unless she said well i'm not clear or you could somehow assess that she wasn't following you but 
from what I can tell, none of that was the case. So this is just giving them extra time to kind of preach and um, try to show authority by giving these examples, which aren't necessary at this time. Yeah, you make a good point because the concept was not difficult to understand and she gave no indication that she needed such an example. He just launched straight into it. And I think you're right. It's a way of controlling the uh, conversation, dominating the conversation and reducing her ability to challenge what he's saying, as you said. Yeah. You know, I can't see everything because I'm a three-dimensional being. Like, back, back, it's on, back and so on and so forth. But I think you're speaking exactly to my point there. Here. Because I do not believe that we have the tools yet. Why not? They will come at some point. Why, why is our current set of tools? Like, let me tell you some of the tools that we have. Well, to me, to me the tools that I have been presented with, okay. presented with sure, sure. I have seen, Which ones what are? I've seen and what I've experienced, have not convinced me. Which are the but tools? they will for sure convince someone else. Mm -hmm. they just have we, we want to know what tools that you have seen and it's not convincing. Well, I don't believe that faith is simply enough. Faith isn't a tool. And faith is what you then take in using the tools you see information is out there and you okay should have asked to hear what faith was right he just took it that she had some meaning and now he's saying well no it's not a tool and now he's sort of going off on it i'm al i always almost always ask this what do you mean by faith i've got mm. an understanding in my mind uh, but it may not be the same as there and then typically when you ask this about faith it's actually some sort of a belief but then just say i believe why would you use the word faith faith typically has like a weaker meaning I have faith. I have a belief and I don't have good reasons. That's typically what you can infer from faith. But other times people have a belief and they say, yeah, I believe X and they might give you a reason. Uh, but faith is oftentimes they just don't even can't give you a reason. That's where faith sort of fills the gap. And so he should have asked her here what, what she meant by faith. Yeah. And I, I, I find yeah. a, a just as quickly say, I find a, a Darwin apologist will bring up faith themselves when they're trying to say that, a non-believer is using faith in the same way that they are. So it's often used in this kind of um, put everybody to the same lower level and therefore say, well, I've got just as good a reason to be a Muslim as you have not to be a Muslim because we both have faith in our respective beliefs, um, which I think is quite fallacious. Yeah. And just a comment there that I see being put in um, reactionary is saying he's giving examples for other people watching. Yeah, that's another point to, to note here, um, which I think is kind of a, a little bit disrespectful in a sense. If you're having a conversation with one people, you're not having a conversation with the crowd. The crowd happened to be listening. And, and so this is really kind of like uh, a bit of grandstanding here. You are here simply for me to speak to the crowd. If that's what's going on, be at least be intellectually honest and say, I'm going to speak to you, but really I want to speak to everybody else. I want everybody else to understand. So I'm going to, I'm going to not always appear to be speaking to you personally. I might be speaking to the crowd. And if somebody said that to me, I said, that's fine. Um, then you, you carry on and speak to the crowd. You don't really need me here. Uh, or if you don't mind, then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just not going to look at you. I'm going to give you examples. I'm going to ask the crowd, are you following me? That sort of thing, right? So um, yes, you can do that, but just be honest about it. But then, you know, don't be upset if somebody else does the same thing. And that's typically what happens in the speaker's corner. There's a bit of this grandstanding. The interlocutor is simply there so the, so the other person can address the crowd. Now, it's a more advanced technique, and you only do this when you've been doing it some time. Uh, but I don't think it's entirely ingenuous to do that. If you're having a conversation with that person, you're speaking specifically to them. You're not there to try and get the whole crowd to understand unless – You've made that clear to the interlocutor. But Rob, generally speaking, I was gonna, sorry, just going to quickly say on that point, generally speaking, these uh, Darwin apologies, you can see in their body language, that's exactly what they're doing because there's all this gesticulating to the crowd, constantly turning their heads as if they're speaking to other people. Whereas if you are focused on the person you're talking to, you wouldn't be doing that. So I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, and you can see the difference. When you've been there a little while and you've done that, you can see when two people are having a one-on-one -on -one and they're really focused on each other, trying to understand each other, trying to respond to each other. And then you can see, as you quite rightly point out, when they're not just speaking one-on-one, -on -one, they're there playing to the crowd. Uh, and you say it's gesticulations, it'll be these examples, it'll be looking around, it'll be talking very loudly. Uh, it's not like she can't hear him. So there's all these things that they do. And you can notice when, when it is. Because there are conversations that happen one-on-one -on -one where the two people are speaking in Speaker's Corner. They don't care who's watching. But they, they, their main focus is on the person they're speaking to. Well, even it, just, just, just one more point on that, Rob, just before we move on. There was a good example of that was when he, he was giving his needless um, example of the stone floor. 
He's making these sweeping gestures, pointing to the floor, getting everybody to look down as if people don't know what a floor is. You don't need to be doing all that kind of thing. So it's all theatre. It's all kind of playing to the crowd. It's just a simple example of it. Yeah. Who put the information? You say, that's my faith. Because you've taken those in faith. So I believe in God because I heard or I knew or whatever that there is a God and I've accepted that information. What makes you believe in God? I have truth because that's now jumping the gun. No, 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 that's jumping it. Let's address the the question of how an agnostic would arrive in answering that question or ascertaining the truth of that question. But I would like to... Why, why, would, why do you want to do that? Right, she's asked you... Um, presumably, I, I don't know, because I've, I've only seen the video where it kind of started. You don't know what happened in the beginning, whether she walked up to him. More likely, he came over to her. Because what will what, happen in Speaker's Corner, for those who haven't been there, Mansur and others are regulars. So they'll wander around the park looking for people to speak to. People who just wander in like this lady, presumably she's not a she's not a regular there. So she'll just be wandering through the park and they will look to speak to somebody. It's not like members of the public, most members of the public won't know who they are. And so they won't walk over and say, hey, can I speak to you? Now, if they know them and they've seen them on videos, they might do that, but that's very rare. And so typically they'll be walking around looking for people to speak to. And so they'll be coming over and say, hey, what do you believe? Or, hey, I'm Muslim. Let me tell you why Islam is, is what you should believe or whatever the case is. So they're on the lookout rather than the other way around. And she's just asked him, hey, you know, why do you believe in God? And he wants to sort of divert back to how can you find out, like what tools have you got to find out what, you know, whether God exists or not? Hopefully, yeah. though, she uh, she might just turn it back again now. Like, you know, no, no, but believer arrives at believer has holistic approach. Many tools. What is, what is, what is your tool? Okay. Tool? The tools that we have, yeah. we have intuitive tools for intuition. Yeah. We have rational faculty, intellect, and rationality. We can reason. We can use inductive reasoning. We can use deductive reasoning. Do you believe in all humans? Just, just by the way, all of those tools uh, the non-believer can use as well, right? So it's not yeah. like he has some tools there that we don't have. As non-believers in this particular case, right? So, and that's very vague as well. Uh, those tools that he's given there, but yes, anybody can employ them. So there's nothing, there's nothing that he's offering so far, at least, that's unique to them, right? Uh, but he hasn't given specifics either as to yeah. what it is that gets them to or gets somebody to Islam. If they are using reasonable reason, they're reasonable. If they're not using reason, like I had a discussion earlier, I left the discussion because I felt like I was speaking to a brick wall. Then I said that's not a reasonable discussion. So people yeah. use reason. <laughs> I, I, I could imagine. I could imagine that conversation was somebody was actually challenging Mansur's position, and therefore he thought it was unreasonable. You could, it, I mean, we don't know, but I could imagine that it was somebody who was not quite as passive as this woman. Yeah, it could be. And again, reasons in the eye of the beholder, right? What one person finds reasonable, somebody else will find unreasonable. So that's that's a very sub, sort of subjective um, assessment. I think whether somebody has a, a, a rational reason is probably you know as good as you're going to get. Um, and then is it going to be convincing? Yeah, that's kind of similar to is it reasonable, right? It's whatever the level of convincing is that you need to accept something. And that's going to be different for different people. Like you and I, Drastic, have got a very high bar for what we might find impressive in the Quran. Most Muslims have got a very low bar because there isn't anything really impressive, objectively speaking. And so they're going to have a much lower bar than we are, for example. So Absolutely. they're going to be impressed with things that we that we are going to sort of roll our eyes around. <laughs> for sure, yeah. A reasonable discussion and you can say they're acting reasonably. And what is what you decide to that? And who, who decides what is reasonable and what is reasonable? many things. We use lots of principles from logic and philosophy, language. For example, we would say... Okay, just just a moment here. She asked, how are you going to, how are you going to, essentially, how are you going to assess what's reasonable? And this kind of is, is waffle here because all of these things, both people are going to use anyway. So it doesn't get you to assess what's actually reasonable. What she's really asking, essentially, is how do you, how do you establish or how do I establish what's reasonable? And these tools are tools that you can both use. So is there some other metric outside of these tools that you're already using? Is there like somebody we can appeal to, right? The, uh, you know, the prime minister of reasonableness or something, whatever it might be. <laughs> if not, then both of us can use these tools, but one might say it's reasonable. The other will say it's unreasonable. Who's going to tell them that they're right or wrong? You, how are you going to adjudicate between this if you're both using all the same tools? So what he's saying here isn't actually like helpful in the sense of like, because what maybe the, the question should have been better phrased. Who adjudicates what's reasonable rather than what tools are you using to discover what might be reasonable or not? Right. That's not quite the question she asked. Yeah. 
there is a principle that is universally accepted by almost everyone apart from a few individuals. It's called the principle of non-contradiction. Two things, mutual exclusive, cannot be true at the same time. Let's say you exist and you don't exist at the same time. I cannot accept that. It doesn't make any sense. It's not reasonable to affirm that at the same time you are existent and non-existent. Yeah? So that's a principle of non-contradiction. I cannot affirm someone is a married bachelor because I know what married means, I know what bachelor means. I cannot, I say something is unreasonable when they say, oh, there's a triangular circle. They're contradictory within their own... Okay, um, that's fine. That, those things are contradictory, um, but unreasonableness doesn't have to be contradictory. So at this moment in time, it's not clear to me if, if he's conflating the two and saying, well, you know, if something is... is uh, if it's automatically contradictory, uh, therefore it's unreasonable, that's fine. But if something's not contradictory, that doesn't mean that it's it's unreasonable or indeed that it's reasonable either way, right? So I think um, this is not particularly helpful in this way. And I think what, what's obviously happening is just speaking off the cuff, right, with the um, you know, law of non-contradiction here. But it's not necessary. Again, both people can use this. So it's just not clear to me that this is he's really answering the question here. Yeah concepts. So we can use that principle as one of the ways to use our reason. Yeah? There are various other tools. We have testimony as our source of... No, 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 no. I mean, see, this is quite irritating because he's almost conflating as if those two things are on the same level. That testimony is as reliable as saying um, an established law of logic like um, principle of non-contradiction. They are in two completely separate realms. Now, it's not that you can't use testimony, but you can't to, to the way he's um, saying this as if they are as reasonable uh, as if they are as useful as one another in the same circumstance, which is a classic thing that you see Muslim apologists do because they are trying to work in the fact that their beliefs are based on hearsay stories that may or may not have happened. Somebody who may have spoken to Muhammad said this about him, etc., and he's trying to equate that with a level of surety about the information you get from that as something like the um, principle of non-contradiction, which I just think is absolute nonsense. Hmm. No, 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 no. I'm generally speaking about how we can know about things and I'll be certain about. When I go to a doctor, I don't first look at his or her certificate on the wall. Sometimes it's not even there yeah, because I look at doctor. And I check their medicine. I trust them that they have gone to a medical school, they had an exam that they had to pass, and they went through a registration process with the GMC if it's in this country, and they have passed that to now safely practice medicine without causing harm. So when that doctor, he or she prescribes a medicine to me for my ailment, my illness, I feel confident that I'm not gonna get killed by it. On the contrary, I should get well. I took that testimony by faith because these are doctors. The GP said you say Yeah, doctor. but no, he's no, 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 because that, that is not the same thing as the kind of testimony that he would um, talk about if it's claims about Muhammad, for example, or claims of miracles. The point about, say, accepting this as testimony from a doctor is that you can go and check the records. You can see if he's actually a registered doctor. There's a line of evidence that you can check whether this is actually true outside of him just saying, I'm a doctor. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we've got medical counsels. We have <clears throat> a whole thing. There's a lot of we, we just bracket it under background information that we carry subconsciously with us, especially in this country. You may not think so in perhaps less developed countries where it's not so strict and somebody who claims to be doing it might be a shaman or a mystic or whatever the case is. But here, if you go to a particular surgery or whatever the case is, as they call it, like a, a walk-in doctors, they will already have things there. They will be uh, certified. You could, you could look them up before you go there. So you're going to have a high level of, of um, confidence that they are uh, professional people that have gone through rigorous. And that's because you've got background information about where you live. You've seen these sort of things before. And, and as you quite rightly say, that's not necessarily the same in other realms of investigation where people are giving personal testimony. Yeah. I use my testimony from them and I accepted it. This is one way of knowing. Science is based on testimony. How many scientific papers, when people bring and publish something, is repeated with the same experimentation with every other scientist and every other lab? No. Maybe some tests and observe, and that's it. Yeah, but the sorry, the stop there, Rob. I mean, once again, the difference is, is that 
all the methodology of their experiment will be in the paper. So therefore, it is potentially the, the potential is there for anybody to go and repeat it if they have the scientific knowledge to do so and the capacity. So it's not fair to say that that is simply testimony in the way of some claim about the Quran, because there is that ability to say, OK, well, I can go and check to see and do this experiment myself. So it's not in the same category. Yeah, and I think, you know, if, if you're an atheist or somebody that's speaking to, you know, Muslim or Christian, you can just grant that, yes, testimony is some form of evidence, right? You can shortcut this long rambling thing. Uh, where it will differ, and maybe we'll come to this in, in the in, in the coming up in the video still, or we have to, we can grant the testimony is some form of evidence. What we're not going to grant, what I'm not going to grant, other, other atheists may, I'm not going to grant that eyewitness testimony is in any way sufficient for a supernatural uh, observation. <laughs> That's what well, I'm yeah. not going to grant. Anything else yeah. that is not that that we have background information for, sure I can grant it. So I can I can you know shortcut this whole thing and say yes, uh, but just differentiate the natural from the supernatural. And in my case, I genuinely it doesn't matter how many people. If a billion people came to me and said that they saw Jesus resurrect and walk among them, I'm not going to accept it. Right? That eyewitness testimony is just out for me. If I don't see it myself, or there's something other than eyewitness testimony, supernatural doesn't get off the ground. And by the way, most courts don't accept it either. So it's not just me, Rob. It doesn't matter if there was you had a million eyewitness testimony. People are not going to accept what seems to be either extraordinary slash supernatural claims in a court of law either. So I'm not alone in that. So we can shortcut all of this sort of stuff and just grant it as, as a non-believer that, yes, eyewitness testimony does form some evidence. It's just not going to be uh, certainly not for me and for courts sufficient for supernatural claims. Yeah, I would agree.